you said earlier, actually earlier in the show today, right? You said that, uh, you know, we have been witnessing this last year, you know, one of the biggest crackdowns on free speech in American history. And, uh, the, you know, some of the people who've been, you know, bearing the brunt of it have been, uh, not the only people by any means, but some of them have been, uh, campus protesters. Now, of course, a lot of those people have just come back to school. The fall semester, uh, has, has just started and, you know, and, and with any luck, you know, I mean, I, I hope, right. Certainly that the, uh, protests, you know, about, about Gaza, you know, really, really start again in, in earnest. And, uh, I, I just kind of, you know, like wanted to know what advice you would give those students about how to, um, you know, like how to resist as best they possibly could the sort of smear campaign and the crackdowns that, you know, that have, you know, certainly were going on at the end of the spring. And I, I expect to start right up, right back up again, you know, now as, as campus protests restart, and, you know, particularly one thing that really hits me about this is that, you know, as I need to tell you less than almost anybody, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, the left or what passes for a left has often to its great detriment, you know, in, in recent years been pretty dismissive of the importance of free speech as, as a concept. And, you know, I, and I, I, I think, right. You know, that, um, part of that case now, right. Has to be about, you know, free, free speech, right. That they, as about, you know, like trying to simultaneously talk about the substance of the issue, but also, you know, also talk about the campus protests as, as a, as a free speech issue. Um, because, you know, I, I think that that's, I think that itself can help, you know, help build support for it right now. And so I, I just kind of wanted to get a, a very general sense of, you know, of, of, you know, what you would tell those students or, you know, what you are telling them as, as far as, you know, what their message should be right now. Well, of course, it's an important question. It has many aspects to it. I will address a few. First of all, I think it's going to be a very tough semester, a very tough academic year, because... I think there were a lot of hard conversations this past summer between students and their parents about going forward. Columbia University, for example, is $80,000 a year. And students were suspended. Students were expelled. Students were denied the right to attend graduation. I'm sure a lot of students, their grades suffered significantly. You can't sit in an encampment 24-7 and expect to be acing your courses. Those are very hard decisions that these students made in the spring semester when they dedicated themselves to Gaza. And I suspect that, as I said, there were a lot of hard conversations with parents about going forward. And I suspect that's going to influence a lot of decisions beginning with the new semester, about whether to participate and what degree of participation. And we have to bear in mind, it's not just suspensions, it's not just expulsions, it's not just denying the right to attend graduation, it's not just the arrest record. The other side is completely ruthless. These are, these are I don't want to say Nazis, but they certainly have a Nazi mi mindset, in my opinion. They were, uh, they're saying, we're hiring, it's a fact, I mean, we, we, read, we read about, we're hiring outside organizations to check who participated in the encampments, and you're not going to join our law firm. You're not joining our law firm. So it's not just about the present, it's about the future. And given the level of sophistication of the technologies, the fact that you were in an encampment you might have to carry that with you for 10 years, you know? So that's gonna to be tough. Number two, I've been asked this question many times and my view is basically the same as yours. I think the, the, the best slogan should be free Gaza, free speech to free Gaza slash free speech to uh, join together those two issues so that 
Some people may not agree with you about Gaza, but they will agree you have the right to speak your mind. You have the right to speak your mind. And a, a label shouldn't be affixed to you, like anti-Semite or Holocaust denier or whatever, because your opinion is different. So I think you can create a very large coalition if you join the two issues with people having maybe doubts about the first, but no doubts about the second, free speech. So the slogan going forward should be free, in my opinion, mm -hmm. free God slash free speech. Number three, I, if, uh, there's a, a section in my cancel culture book in which I predicted exactly what happened. I said that I wrote, I could read it to you, uh, but I'm not going to, I'll just summarize it. I said, if you start using the standard of hurt feelings, then if a Palestinian says, I don't want an Israeli soldier to speak on campus because that makes me feel unsafe, it hurts my feelings as a Palestinian, I said, that's going to backfire. I wrote it in the book. I used the example of Palestinians and the, the conflict. I said, Israeli students are going to start saying, we don't feel safe. And it hurts our feelings when somebody chants from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Or when somebody says we support Hamas. So, but there's a very big difference. You know what the very big difference is? The other side has lots of money. Right. So they could say the Jewish students' feelings are hurt. They feel unsafe. So unless you repress the encampment, we're withholding a hundred million dollars. The Palestine students and their supporters don't have that leverage. Right. And so now the Bill Ackmans, the Sternlicks, the Crafts, they are using that argument about feelings and safe spaces to crush any dissent, to nip it in the bud. Now, the oddest thing for me is in the midst of all of this nonsense about hurt feelings and feeling unsafe, everybody forgets our own history of free speech. Now listen, Ben, I hope not that you remember, but you are aware mm -hmm. that when the Nazis party wanted to march in Skokie, well, guess what? Skokie was a community of a large number of Holocaust survivors. They felt unsafe, they said. They said it revived memories of the Nazi Holocaust. And the ACLU defended the Nazi party and they marched. The courts held up their right. And that's always been considered a very proud moment in the history of the ACLU. Arya Nair, if my memory is correct, was the one who argued the case. Who was, he claims he's the son of Holocaust survivors, whether it's true, but who knows. Um, but the whole history of the defense of free speech, its landmark cases have been completely, not just forgotten, but effaced. If the Nazi party can march through Skokie, Illinois, the home of a large community of Holocaust survivors, then why can't students chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free? If you know the tradition, then it's a no brainer that they have that right to chant that. I happen not to like the slogan, but I recognize they have the right. 
to chant that slogan. They have the right to chant that slogan. And remember, they say, well, we're, they're, they're attacking the state of Israel. Has everybody forgotten that our Supreme Court upheld that you have the right to advocate the overthrow of the U.S. government? Has everybody forgotten that? That long history of Supreme Court decisions finally upholding the principle that unless there is I'm, I, the language constantly changed, but I don't feel the language is so important. Unless uh, it's very clear in present danger right. that yep. it's going to result in the overthrow of the government, you have the right to, to say it because the argument is that even though you disagree with the overthrow of the government, meaning the powers that be, there may be useful critiques contained in that program that we should hear. You know, it's the Millian argument, the John Stuart Mill argument, right. that you may not agree with overthrowing the government, but when they say they want to overthrow the government, they want to say because the capitalist system is this and the capitalist system is that and, blah, and so and so and so on, and that there may be useful arguments there. So even if they're advocating the overthrow, we should still listen. So if we as Americans have the right to advocate the overthrow of the government, then certainly Palestinians and their supporters have the right to advocate the dissolution of the state of Israel. You may not like it, but guess what? There are a lot of patriotic Americans who don't like the idea of overthrowing the government. Right. But you have that right. So that whole history of defense of free speech it went out the window, but regrettably, the door was opened by the woke culture with all the talk about hurt feelings and safe spaces and blah, 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 blah. They, they paved the way to the catastrophe that befell the college campuses in the spring and probably will be much worse in the fall. Yeah. And, you know, and of course people always say, oh, they would have done it anyway. But I, I always, this, this, yeah, always, you know, this, you know, this always drives me crazy because you don't, make it easy for them. you don't hand it to them in a silver platter. Yeah, exactly. Right. You, you don't have to, the fact that your enemies are going to try to do something doesn't mean that you should, you know, that it's like fine for you to do things that make it easier for them to do it. Right. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we could have we could have had a real argument like the one I'm trying to present now. The Skokie example, the overthrow the government example. You know, we had cases in the court where people uh, a fellow uh came to court wearing a t-shirt saying fuck the draft. Right. And his right was preserved. Remember, our our Rights included the right to burn the flag. It was called expressive speech. You had the right because you were making a statement by burning the flag, so it was protected. Expressive speech, that was during the war in Vietnam. So we had a whole rich tradition that we could have argued with. You know, it was very striking to me. Mm. When, when uh, President Shafiq went before the uh, that clown committee, uh, in the House, somebody commented, it was a very sharp remark, very sharp remark. I wish I had said it. He said, do you know what the only two words that never passed her lips when she went before the committee? Two words never passed her lips. Academic freedom. Right. It completely jettisoned it. Let it go. Yeah. It's pathetic. Well, uh, yeah, I think that that's, uh, yeah, I, I think that it's, I think that it's this giant strategic blunder and certainly those of us who would see ourselves as representing, you know, the, uh, that, 
kind of old left tradition. Um, you know, I, I think that if the basis of your politics is thinking that, you know, ordinary working class people, you know, have the capacity to, you know, take over society, you know, can, can certainly govern themselves, uh, you know, you can't believe that they're, they're so stupid. They have to be protected, you know, from, from wrong think. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron-exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron-exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more, go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish.